figure out a way to connect with each other, um, you know, to talk further after the open house, um, you know, obviously not tonight because it's very late for you, um, but we'll be able to uh, go through the event today um, and hopefully get more uh, information for you. Um, so I, I definitely would like to welcome everyone here. Um, so um, we have quite the audience today here local, but obviously um, far. And I think that that's one of the great things about Albany um, Law School and our online program is that we really have those, those reaches uh, beyond the Capital District here in Albany. And that's really, really exciting. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us here tonight. Um, if anyone who any of our guests, if you'd like to put into the chat the programs that you're interested in, if it's LLM, if it's master's certificate, advanced certificate, or um, in which discipline. Um, and then throughout the event, if you do have questions, please um, feel free to put those into chat. And um, those of us who are part of faculty and staff will certainly try to answer your questions. Um, and so I do wanna let everybody know that we are going to be recording um, our open house program tonight. Um, and so that certainly, if you wanted to review a copy of it afterwards for more information, we can get that to you as well. Um, but thank you so much all for joining us. And we are going to um, get started here. Um, and I know, um, Dina Lett, did you want to say a few words as we begin here? Um, sure. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alicia Willett. I'm the president and dean at the law school. And I just wanted to join you uh, briefly at tonight's open house uh, to welcome you to the Albany Law community. Um, we are thrilled that you're thinking about Albany Law School for one of our specialty programs. Uh, we have designed them with you in mind, uh, with, with care. Uh, they are, the classes are incredible, the professors are incredible, the opportunities are really um, terrific and, and we'd love to help you explore. Um, as students in the Albany Law programs, you are part of our community and we are committed to your success. And the fact that you're here tonight tells me and tells the faculty and, and staff who are with us tonight that you're committed to your own success. So let's partner and uh, do this thing together and help you learn more about law, whether you're a, a lawyer um, or you're someone who's a non-lawyer who wants to get a mm -hmm. master's degree and learn about law, whether you're coming in uh, from Ethiopia or from Colony, um, we welcome you and um, just enjoy your evening tonight. And, and uh, I really hope that I will get the chance to meet you, whether one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whether in person or on Zoom, uh, and that you will have a chance to visit us, as they say, in real life, um, in the building that you see on your screen now. It's, it's a beautiful uh, facility and there's all kinds of opportunities. And as our students in the online graduate program, you're our students, you're part of our community and we want, we want to see you um, and, and get to know you. So welcome, enjoy your evening. And with that, I'll go turn it back to Allison. Thank you so much. And I, um, I know you may join us for a little bit or pop off um, to go to another event probably. Um, but once again, thank you for joining us and for your words. Um, so I'd like to introduce our team here. I'm um, here in the online graduate program. Um, you'll hear shortly from Thomas Rosenberger, who is our assistant dean and director of online programs. Um, you'll hear from Nicole, um, who is our senior admissions recruiter and counselor. I'm Allison Rosenblatt, associate director of online programs. Stephanie, who is new to our team, um, she will be, um, if you have questions during the chat, she's watching that chat for us as well. Um, and she is our admissions recruiter and counselor. Um, Anthony Haynes, um, is he on tonight? I didn't see the whole list. Um, is our associate dean for strategic initiatives and the director of our cybersecurity and privacy law program. And then Patricia Young, who I don't believe is with us this evening, but she's our instructional technologist. Um, so this is just one part of the team who will work with you um, while you're a student here at the law school. Um, and certainly our team that we're here to help you get through the process, get you enrolled, answer questions that you have, and certainly go over um, tonight's open house for you. So we're gonna talk about the Albany Advantage today, our academic offerings, what to expect in an online course, student resources, program requirements, the admissions process, tuition scholarships and financial aid, your next steps, and then have time for a question and answer. And certainly throughout the event, please feel free to put any questions that you have within the chat. 
So that way we can answer those hopefully in real time. And there will be things that we will cover throughout the event. So when we talk about the, the Albany Advantage, um, Albany Law School, um, while online coursework at law schools is, uh, is, is newer, uh, Albany Law School, we are the oldest independent law school in the nation. And so we have this, this legacy um, that we've been around for a while. So our programming um, offered in the online setting um, may be new. However, um, the law school and our program is not. And there's a lot that we have to give um, to our program. We can help customize our student experiences. We um, are ranked in the top 20 most innovative law schools. And our focus regardless if it is within our JD program or our online program, we have a strong mission that we educate and empower tomorrow's leaders. We engage professionals, committed um, public servants, inspiring community change agents and creative problem solvers. And that's something that we've been doing for a very long time. Uh, another part of the Albany advantage of our online grad program is that we're ranked number one in flexibility. And we talked about that customizing um, and you'll hear more about that um, when we speak to our programming and our program requirements. Um, our students span the nation and the globe. I think it's, it's obvious here tonight um, that, uh, you know, we have somebody joining us from outside of New York, which is, um, which is really amazing, outside of the U.S. Um, and we have students that are involved and enrolled in our program or have graduated from Silicon Valley, Washington, D.C., Texas, Illinois, Puerto Rico, Sweden, Mexico, India, and all throughout the state of New York. And, um, you know, a lot of students often say, oh, I'm, you know, a non-traditional student. Um, and I would say that we have such a wide variety of students in our program um, that span from many backgrounds and including ages. Um, and our average age is about 40 years old. Um, so I would say our student is, you know, there, there's no such thing as a non-traditional student. Um, and so tonight, one of the first things we are going to discuss are our academic offerings. Um, and I am going to hand it over to Tom um, to begin um, reviewing our academic offerings. Thanks, Allison. Appreciate it. Um, yes, as Allison said, I'm Tom Rosenberger. I'm the Assistant Dean and Director for Online Programs. So uh, the programs are, as you see on your slide there, Cybersecurity and Data Privacy, Financial Compliance and Risk Management, Health Law and Healthcare Compliance, Human Resources, Law Leadership and Policy, which we're proud to say is quite unique. And our next program we're really excited to launch in 2022 is Government Affairs and Advocacy. And that's of course a space, if you know anything about Albany Law, you know that we are in the government space for certain. So very excited about that. Now the way, um, the, the best and I think most valuable way to introduce these programs to you is to introduce the, the faculty who help develop and hone the curriculum and hire um, other practitioners to teach some of the courses. And so we'll start out with the cybersecurity and data privacy program. Just having trouble with my animations here. Give me a, there we go, I got it all. Uh, I wanna introduce Dean Anthony Haynes, who is the faculty program director for the cybersecurity program. Dean Haynes, you're with us, right? Well, if I'm not with you, I'm somewhere. <laughs> You're with us virtually. Welcome tonight. Um, let's get started, Dean Haynes. Uh, if you can give us a sense of why Albany Law, such a traditional, the oldest independent law school, as Allison said, why we broke into the online space, why we did the cyber program, what it means for us, what it means for the, the industry. Wow, that's a lot to cover. <laughs> So Albany Law School was the first law school to have an all online program in cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, because of the success of our program, a number of other law schools have copied us. And so now there is some competition, but we're still the first in the original. And at that time, we were the first of three law schools to have either online or in residence, like cybersecurity and data privacy program. And the niche that we saw was this. Most of the programs focus on information technology or IT, probably 90 to 95%. And it so happens that there's an increasing amount of work that's not IT work in the cybersecurity and data privacy space. There's compliance, 
There's risk management. There's quasi-legal tasks around figuring out what the laws are going to be. And matter of fact, there's enough work that both lawyers and non-lawyers can fill these roles in organizations, both for profit, big companies, and nonprofit or governmental to help them deal with these risks of the law and changes in cybersecurity and data privacy. And so at that time, we did a survey of people in the United States and particularly in the Northeast to see what types of advanced degrees were they most curious about? And this is in the 2015, 2014 time period. And the answer was that they were most curious about learning more in cybersecurity and data privacy. In addition, we have an affiliation with the uh, SUNY Albany, which is a state university. We're separate from them, but have an affiliation. And they have a college that focuses on cybersecurity there. And so it made sense for us to collaborate with this cyber college at University of Albany SUNY in order to provide more content and more courses. And so over the years, what we've done is we've really thought deeply about having purely focused on cybersecurity content. Other programs may have many courses, but they're recycling courses that don't particularly relate to cybersecurity. For example, a JD course in civil procedure or a JD course in administrative law. And what you really care about in the cyber program is what about supply chain cybersecurity? Not just crime law, criminal law, but what about cyber crime? What about this idea of cyberspace law or cybersecurity and data privacy? So thinking about these focus classes is really an important point here. But for all of the degree programs, whether it's healthcare or government affairs and advocacy, HR leadership law or financial compliance and risk management or cybersecurity, all of our programs focus on being practical, on giving you takeaways that you can apply to your current job and that will help you in your current occupation. In the first cohort of students that came into the cyber program, one of them was a um, lawyer who had been in the area of privacy law for about 10 years before coming into the program. And I kept asking him, is my content, is my course helpful to you because you probably could be a teacher here? And he said to me, Anthony, I'm sorry, he said to me, Dean Haynes, yes, this is definitely a helpful content. I'm applying what you're teaching in this class to my current job and making changes at my company where I'm general counsel there. So that's our focus. So unlike other kinds of programs that might give you much more of the black letter law and the big fat textbooks, we try to balance things by giving you these practical applications so that you can have an impact very quickly in your current job and occupation. So Tom, I don't know if I really answered your question, but it's kind of my, my five minute spiel on why cyber and why it's interesting at Albany Law School. Yeah, I think you, you did. And thank you for saying that the practicality of it is not just is not unique to the cyber program. It is really the basis on which we've built all of these programs and we continue to build, including the new government program, which you can imagine there is quite a bit of law to study there. Um, but all of the courses are being built around this practical application perspective, um, because at the end of the day, as Allison said, our average age, student age is 41. We know that people use our program, these degree programs to uh, help climb the ladder, right? Get higher on the totem pole, so to speak, in, in the corporate or government sector. And uh, if we weren't practical, we wouldn't be giving the students real life situations, scenarios, um, to work through in our in in the courses and therefore it wouldn't be directly applicable. So yes, we're very, very proud of that if you can't tell. Um, also Dean Haynes, the other um, uh, question I have for you, but I also have it for another special guest, Justin Foster. So I'll kind of ask both of you. Um, Justin is a graduate from a, the program and actually he received he received a dual degree. So he studied cybersecurity and data privacy as well as financial compliance and risk management. And I think Justin joins us with his son tonight. If I saw correctly there on the camera for a second. Welcome, Justin. Thank you for Hello. being Hello. with yes. us <laughs> after a busy day's work. Um, so the question, I, whoever wants to go first is fine. You can talk more about your own experience. Dean Haynes can talk more um, universally, but what are the job outcomes? Who, who comes to the cyber program? Um, who, what kinds of jobs might you have had and now are attracted to a program like this as a way to grow into more of a leadership policy, compliance, risk management type role? Yeah, this is a great question. So the International Association of Privacy Professionals, IAPP, every year does a survey to look at opportunities 
in the regulatory compliance, law and policy angles of cybersecurity and data privacy. And if you look at their surveys, what they can show you is that there is significant demand for non-IT, for people who aren't looking at programming a computer or a software system, but can really do the compliance side and the demand is greater than the supply. You can go into LinkedIn or monster.com and search for these kind of jobs that deal with the analysis of regulatory compliance and risk management and so on. And you will find that there are a whole range of jobs. And so the opportunities span every industry, finance, healthcare, education, where we are right now, of course, things in the legal environment. So all of these are areas where you're going to find demand for folks that can do this. Uh, we recently had a request from um, a company if, they, if we could recommend to them one of our graduates to fill a position. I can't remember if it was like Microsoft or IBM or some, some, some fairly big company. Um, and we forwarded a name to them and this person was extremely attractive and they had further communications with that person. So there is demand um, in a number of sectors because there's just not enough people with both the skill set and the interest. And so uh, Justin is with us and I, I don't know, Justin, if you, consider your career growth more related to the cyber topics you took or the financial compliance topics you took. But the point is we're flexible. We let you take both um, and, and you received you know, that dual degree. So how has Albany Law helped you professionally? And if we hear a baby, it's okay. <laughs> I have three children under seven running around my house. So I have to be careful because a lot of times you'll see them and they want to have cameos where they will not stop until they have their moment of time with the group. So, so Justin, I understand. Justin was one of my former <laughs> students. So, so we're, 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 we, we go back. <laughs> yes, I, I, I appreciate it. No, my, my daughter is one who at times requires personal time. She's really good at setting boundaries and telling us now I would like to be left alone. Um, so, <laughs> so it's one of those times where she's decided that she would much rather just venture out on her own for just a few moments. Um, and she, maybe she was just so excited to hear about all the careers she was ready to sign up for Albany Law. Um, but, uh, so in in my experience, I think what uh, Dean Haynes speaks to uh, is, is fairly accurate. Um, and I dropped my LinkedIn uh, profile into the chat if anybody would like to have a conversation offline. So my experience is working within the government sector. I work for the, the state of New York with the Department of Motor Vehicles, which sounds like it has nothing to do with any of this. Um, but in the state of New York, uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles is essentially the primary identification holder for the state. If you are going to do anything, you have to get an ID from the Department of Motor Vehicles, whether you get a license or not. Uh, and that's one of those things that everybody may or may not know you by. Um, so with that comes a great set of responsibility, especially around cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, I originally applied to Albany Law in 2018 uh, with the understanding that at that point, there were not enough people with any kind of background that would actually tie law and technology together working within the organization. And there was a, there was a dire need. Um, so I saw my opportunity to go and apply. And, and, and I can say safely that I am the only person working in a 3000 person agency that has this particular expertise and background um, and moving, uh, moving in such a way that I combined it with the financial compliance and risk management uh, it's allowed me to work on a number of projects. Uh, so at this point, I have had work uh, submitted that I did both in class and then outside of class, taking that, those same approaches and the same lessons, uh, end up on the floor of the New York State uh, Chamber for, for debate and for approval. Uh, I have designed and implemented the compliance rules around um, COVID tracking and quarantine process for New York State employees, which is about 250,000 people in the state of New York. Uh, we built it up at the DMV first, and it was rolled out everywhere else because it was so successful um, and actually met the requirements in such a way that other agencies did not have to vet them because somebody who maybe actually knew what they were talking about designed it. Uh, so, um, so it's been a really great uh, opportunity for me to interact with this. And I will say there's not a day that goes by where the time that I spent at Albany Law is not somehow leveraged. <laughs> Uh, for the rest of the state of New York. So I, I appreciate the time to be here and I certainly welcome any questions about that specifically. Um, and like I said, there's a, there's a link out there for anyone who's interested in reaching out afterwards. 
And I've also pasted in chat a link to a report from the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the AAPP, on the state of the privacy job market. And they gave you some examples of salary ranges and job titles um, if you want to have a starting point to go into minister.com or LinkedIn to see what's out there. Wonderful. Thank you, Dean Haynes. Thank you, Justin, very much for uh, double dipping tonight on dad duty and, and helping out with our programming. We very much appreciate it. And it warms our heart every time we hear you talk about how um, directly applicable your studies have been to your career. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. I'm going to switch now. Again, my animations are line by line, not sure why, but I'm going to switch to the financial compliance and risk management program where we have Professor uh, Christine Chung, uh, the director of this program. And this was our second program. So at this point, it is well established. Welcome, uh, Professor Chung. And I want to ask you tonight a couple questions. The first one is kind of been alluded to in the previous conversation, but with practical programming that's designed to be applicable to what's happening now in the field, that would lead you to assume that the courses could become outdated rather quickly. So in your program and really in general, what are we doing to um, ensure that we remain current and relevant and future focused? That's an excellent question because this is a fast moving field. Can you, can you, you can hear me, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple of things, I think that we are, we work closely with our faculty every sort of every time asking, do we need to refresh our course? So there's a continuous really review of the curriculum to ensure that we are remaining both cutting edge and practical, right? That's one way that we try to ensure through course updates and the like that we are really where we need to be topically. Um, the other thing that we think about is, you know, we have a series of special speaking events and, and other guest lectures that will come in and give presentations, sort of one-off presentations on very timely topics. So just recently, we had uh, a, a friend of our program give a presentation on digital assets, sort of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and the like, and you are very much ripped from the headline topic. And we're able to do that on that sort of, you know, we're always thinking about who we could bring in in that capacity. And this is also a, a person who's teaching in our program as well. So there was both the sort of the course that she's designed as well as, um, you know, presentations that are, that are designed to get the word out about what we're doing. Uh, and then I think we're very careful about who we hire and we're hiring people that are on the front lines to teach our courses so that, you know, they are day to day, you know, fighting the battles, answering the questions that have, that haven't been asked or answered before. And I think all of those things contribute to the timeliness of the program and its applicability to folks who are currently in the field or who want to get into the field. Yeah, and that's why um, we we design these programs intentionally to be taught and delivered by adjunct faculty because they're not trapped in a law school seven days a week, right? They're out in the field, they're doing, they're breathing this. They are oftentimes the ones who could write the textbook, but they're too busy doing the work. Um, so they're bringing you that practicality and it, just to go a little bit deeper into the example with Professor Hoffman, who's also an alum of the law school, with the blockchain uh, topic, when when she brings guest speakers into her virtual classroom, these are the these are people who are inventing this. They're figuring this out. They're on the forefront of this rapid evolution of how the blockchain is to be used and, and the data privacy concerns and uh, uh, smart contracts and what does that mean for the for industries and all of the currency stuff, it's wild. So never a dull moment, always keeping it up to date. And we're able to do that because of the people that we have teaching our programs. My, and I also, Tom, yeah. I also wanted to mention that we look for synergies between our programs. So, uh, you know, as, as evidenced by, right, our, our prior speakers, you know, for example, in New York State, there's sort of a New York cyber regulation that applies to financial institutions, right? So cyber, cyber security, cyber regulation is something that we need to be thinking about, obviously, in our cyber program, but also in our financial compliance and risk management program. Um, another good example would be something like um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is a, essentially saying you can't bribe government officials overseas to get business, right? It's industry neutral. There are a whole bunch of cases involving sort of healthcare organizations. 
um, financial institutions. Again, so we're looking for these connections between our programs because there are a lot of kind of cross-disciplinary compliance related issues that come up across our programs, right? And this is a space where we have a traditional strength as Albany Law School. You know, you will find when you go out into state agencies and so forth that there are tons of our graduates out there doing very cutting edge work um, as a regulator or self-regulatory organization. So we're that's another way that we remain current is that we we are our people are there, we're in those conversations, and we're looking for those synergies between programs so that we're kind of remaining up to date across across programs. And that kind of allows me to hand you my final question uh, in, a, in a way, which was how applicable is the financial compliance and risk management program outside of the financial sector? You, you did start to answer it already. Looking at the courses we offer on the slide there, um, the highlighted is the two-part compliance officer series. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, and, and that's a really good question. I mean, as I was mentioning a few moments ago, sort of there are um, the sort of the, the nutshell version is there are a whole bunch of securities laws that apply to every you know company without regard to whether it's a financial services institution. So like if you're like insider trading, for example, right? That's something that is industry neutral. It doesn't just happen at financial institutions. There are a lot of financial crimes, like money laundering and that sort of thing, they happen, you know. It's not just banks, it's not just brokerage firms. So the securities laws touch a lot of different companies and the financial crimes laws touch a lot of different companies um, and touch government as well. So, so that is definitely the case. And, and I think in thinking about our compliance officer sort of program, what, you've, what you see there is, you know, the role of the compliance officer um, is, tr is a transferable skill. Right. So in our program, we focus on the securities laws, bank uh, money laundering and certain of the criminal certain parts of the criminal code. Right. We focus on that. But that doesn't mean that the like we're looking at all sorts of different companies and industries. So we're teaching people in those courses. You know, what does it mean to set up an internal compliance program? What does it mean to set up a whistleblower program? Um, what what rules do we have to have around, you know, specific types of compliance? Right. So our courses work both within in the individual program, but also there are opportunities to take courses in different programs that will blend together nicely. Definitely agree. And as uh, as the team will share in a little bit, depending on whether you're seeking an LLM, a master's or an advanced certificate, there's uh, some flexibility in what you can take. So if you're a financial compliance a master's student, that there is room in that program to take courses in other tracks um, to make it as meaningful for you as the individual as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that the compliance field and compliance, sort of the idea of a compliance professional has really grown and flowered in recent years. And so we want to be sure that we're teaching you skills that will be applicable to you regardless of the physical place where you end up working, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's an important, we have that in mind as we're designing our programs and as we're choosing our faculty. Okay, thank you, Professor Chung. So the next program um, on my slide deck is health law and healthcare compliance. And it looks like Professor Tenenbaum is not on the call. I suspect she might be having um, a Zoom issue. So what I'll do is I'll talk briefly about this one, but we will make the commitment to the students. So I did see uh, in the chat, there's at least one person interested in health. Um, we'll make the commitment to you. If you reach out and ask, we will put you in touch with Professor Tenenbaum. She will have a private conversation with you, um, talk about your career interests and whether the program suits your needs. So uh, health law and healthcare compliance, it's another one that's extremely broad. It's broad in the people we see come into the program. It's broad in the topics we cover. Um, it's broad in the jobs that people are seeking as a result of completing the program or the promotions or advancements. We have had uh, lower level, you know, business or organizational management workers that happen to be in the healthcare sector that want to learn more about um, compliance in healthcare. We have had RNs who are tired of being on the front line and want to get more into policy, perhaps risk management, quality control, these sorts of things. Um, we've even had MDs who 
have practically no busy, no free time in their calendar, right? But yet they too value these skills. Um, so whether it's foundational HIPAA compliance skills um, or whether it's really drilling into medical malpractice in a way that is practical and by the way taught by uh, uh, somebody who is on the front lines working at a major firm in Manhattan representing the biggest of hospitals and clients. Um, that's who you're learning from in that course or long-term care and learning how vast that sector is, which I happen to learn that a bit because I worked with that professor directly to build that course. And it's, it's fascinating what you don't know about some of these topics. And then uh, False Claims Act, which is taught by Professor Adam Katz, who's an assistant US attorney um, in the Northern District of New York. And he's prosecuting uh, under the False Claims Act, seven, five, not, hopefully not seven days a week, five days a week. Um, this is his bread and butter. This is his area of expertise. He knows it better than anybody in his in his group, and he studies it every day. He's at the front lines of it. Oh, and by the way, he's there as your teacher for the course. So lots of um, options here, some variety in terms of what you can take three credit courses to get a deeper perspective on a topic versus one credit courses that give you sort of a um, uh, broad and le I would say sh shallower perspective on a topic, but one that maybe doesn't need to go as deep. Um, that's the split, by the way, the top set are the three credit courses, the bottom set are the one credit courses in this case. So as I said, anybody wanting to learn more about this program, it, it's a very uh, popular program. It's been growing the past few years, may or may not be related to the pandemic, right? Um, please get in touch. We'll, we'll put you in touch with Professor Tenenbaum and She'll, she'll have a quick chat with you, uh, give you whatever you wanna learn about that one. And then the next program is Human Resources, Law, Leadership and Policy. And you know, I say we just launched this last year, but we launched it using all of the best practices and lessons learned from the prior three programs. And we worked tirelessly with the subject experts out in the field and industry organizations to make sure that our program was practical and applicable to what the what the workforce needs really are right now and in, to, in the future. So to represent the HR program is Associate Dean, uh, sorry, I forgot your title, Mary. Assistant Dean, but you can give me um, a raise if you'd like. You can bump me up. Assistant Dean of Career and Professional Development Center, which means we'll also hear from you again in a few moments on that note. Um, but to talk about this program, uh, Mary, what are, what, are, what are we doing specifically to ensure that we're aligned with the industry? Um, okay, so this program um, is very near and near to, to me, obviously. Um, because we are, what we have done here is we've created a program that focuses on the laws that govern human resources management and employment issues. And in designing the program, we made, we made sure, made certain to align uh, with the um, Society for Human Resources Management, the professional association. And we did that to make sure that we really had our finger on the pulse of what is happening right now in the world of um, employment law and labor law and the issues that come up for professionals who are working in this space. Um, you'll see from the courses listed here that we focus very heavily on obviously the employment laws that every manager needs to know about as well as the regulatory landscape that is changing, especially right now. Um, we've, I think, done a great job of um, hitting on the main issues that uh, professionals need to know about in order to both, you know, lead their organizations um, in a way that's going to mitigate risk and also provide opportunities for growth and development for their human capital. Yeah, definitely. And some prospective students have asked us how this, for someone who's in HR or wants to be in HR kind of as their career track, 
but feels that they need a master's degree to uh, continue to climb the ladder and might assume that something like an MBA or a master's in organiz organizational development is their only path. What would you say to them about uh, the differences between those two that I mentioned and our program? Yeah, well, I think the, the, the heart of our program is really that it's taught with a legal lens. And what we're seeing is that HR professionals are faced with um, more and more regulatory issues that they need to be prepared to address. And so what this degree does is it helps those professionals by providing them with an understanding and foundation um, of the law and the regulations if they're not already practicing attorneys. And for those who are already practicing, it, it helps them to really um, narrow in on the issues that are important. And I think in that way, it's different from an organizational program that's really focusing on the business side of um, the practice um, and similarly different from an MBA program. And that's not to say that we're not considering the business issues, right? Because our faculty come from leading industries. It's simply to say that if this program combines a deep understanding of the laws and regulations with you know, the role of the HR professional as they serve the business. Exactly, and I'm looking at the list of courses and I'm thinking about, I'll, I'll name one um, as an example, Global Human Resources and the Law. We're working on uh, refining that course, that curriculum right now with a practitioner who's worked at a number of uh, in multinational organizations. And it's going to be sort of a quick hit. Each, each module or each week is going to be a specific issue that needs to be addressed or there might be unique challenges that someone who's only worked in the domestic space wouldn't even be aware of or wouldn't think of. And she's designing that course um, really to put the students in the shoes of the practitioner at a multinational organization. Say, oh, wow, things are different with regard to issue X, hiring, whatever it is, contracts, right? Um, things are really different around the globe and to kind of give give different perspectives and be, be aware of what to uh, what, what you might face out there. So I'm very excited about that one in particular. And as I said earlier, we're really proud of this program because it's quite unique. One can get a human resources education outside of the legal academy, but uh, we happen to think that the legal academy is the right place to get the compliance and, and risk lens on this, on this uh, sector. Anything else, Mary? That's it, Tom. I, I think that you you hit everything. And I, I mean, I would just mention, you know, one other thing about the program and in is that it it it's connecting HR professionals who might be interested in one day, you know, ascending to the role of uh, chief talent management or or um, uh, chief human resources office officer and and it's connecting those students with um, leaders in the industry. Exactly. And that that's a good point across all of our programs, the networking. We've just described who our faculty are generally, right? Think of the networking. Our students on surveys have told us that the number one value they see in our uh, program model and how we do business, right, is having direct access to those people who are at the top of, of their fields, really. So great point, Mary. Thank you very much. And finally, I want to introduce Professor Ayers, who's here tonight to talk about the new Government Affairs and Advocacy Program, which we are launching later um, this spring in, in 2022. There is not, it, you'll notice on the slide that there is not as much detail on this slide as on the previous slide, and that's because we have been meeting with industry experts, um, so, uh, uh, advisory panels, um, ourselves, other members of the law school community and, and the like to really make sure that the course offerings we put together and 
are underway at this point um, are going to meet the needs of, of the students. And so Professor Ayers, if you could perhaps start with what the general framework of, of the curriculum is going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tom. So um, hi, everybody. It's great to see you. And, and I encourage you to reach out directly to me if you think I could be of any use. Um, my name is Ava Ayers. I'm a member of the uh, faculty at the law school. Um, I, before I worked for the law school, I was in the New York State Solicitor General's Office, which is the appellate branch of the State Attorney General's Office. Um, before that, I clerked for Sonia Sotomayor on the um, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And I've been one of the two faculty directors working on designing this program. I want to say the slides give you, I think, half, because the way we've designed this program is really for two different target audiences. One of them is folks who are interested in lobbying. Um, that is anybody who were, and, and by lobbying, I mean anybody who works for a private firm or a nonprofit group who advocates uh, with their target audience being government officials. So, you know, that doesn't just mean um, the fancy well-paid uh, lobbyists in the private firms, although we certainly have lots of those on our advisory board and um, you'll be able to meet them if you join the program. But also, you know, nonprofit activist groups, people who are um, working to serve others and change the world, uh, who also want to try to persuade government officials or work with government officials uh, to design and implement policy. So that's one track. And what we, what we think is that this program could be useful, if you're interested in that track, that the program could be useful either to people who are already working in that space without a law degree and who recognize that understanding law better could help you understand and participate in discussions in a deeper way than before, or people who are not at all in that field yet, but are interested in that field, um, where, again, you don't need a JD to be effective in the world of government, because getting a JD involves a whole package of skills, some of which you'll never use. You know, if the, the typical lobbyist uh, doesn't have to file papers to sue anybody. So why spend time and money learning how to do that? Um, we've been designing this program with just what we think are the core essentials. And so the second track is for people who are not on the lobbying side, but working inside government, uh, working for the legislature, working for a government agency, working for local governments, um, state, federal, local. You know, there's so many different government jobs, there are, if you include local government, which you absolutely should, there are literally thousands of different governments you could work for. And so this program is designed, again, to give people the basics. There will be different tracks within the program for people who are on the government track or the lobbying track. You can mix and match to some extent, and, and we'd be happy to work with people who are interested in doing that. But we think that you know, for folks who want to be effective in government, my experience in government as a lawyer was that there are just certain conversations where if you don't understand the law, you have to step back and let the people who do understand the law have the conversation while you wait for their judgment. And so what this program is designed to do is to help empower people to not have to step back when that conversation comes up, to be able to analyze things, things themselves, to speak that mysterious language that lawyers speak without going through all the time and expense of law school um, and to know what you need to know to make a difference. So again, it's it's really two different tracks within the one program. And good, good point. Um, and uh, next time we do an open house, we'll have an updated <laughs> slide because we have more information available now. Yeah. Um, but but things are coming together really nicely and, I, and I'm really looking forward to seeing our first cohort of students. Um, this program following the path we've been on tonight through the through the degree areas it is different than the others. It's not an industry, so to speak, right? Or at least it shouldn't be. Why is Albany Law uniquely positioned to do this? Clearly, we're positioned to do the others. They're quite successful. Why do we think this will be successful for us here and now? Right. So Albany Law has always had a special relationship with government because of our um, situation being the only law school in the state capital, um, and New York, you know, isn't just a state. If it seceded from the country, it would be the twelfth or thirteenth biggest economy in the world. So, you know, it's it's quite a capital to be in. Um, obviously, it has lots of stuff 
to study government wise, some of it good and some of it bad. Um, and the law school has been there um, studying it for a long, long time. So in terms of what's going on at the law school, one of the things that I think is exciting about this program is that we have uh, resources like our government law center, um, which I served as the director of before I became faculty co-director to this program. Um, the government law center is um, a group of attorneys and student interns who uh, work directly with government stakeholders to do legal research and analysis um, and to mentor students who are interested in that track. And, you know, those resources will be available to students in this program. One of the things the Government Law Center is great for is just if you're interested in, say, education law or education policy, um, talk to them, talk to me. We'll put you in touch with great attorneys in government who are currently practicing in that field, government ethics, healthcare, you know, whatever it is that, that criminal justice is a big one, um, immigration, whatever your policy interest, um, we can help connect you to folks who will tell you about what it's like to be a lawyer or a non-lawyer practicing in those areas and who will help connect, get you connected to folks who know how to get a job in those areas. And so I think you know, the law school's connection to government it's important to know that even though it's an online program, you know, once you're an Albany Law student, you're an Albany Law student, and those resources are going to be fully available to you. Yes, thank you. Definitely. Our, our roots clearly run uh, very, very deep in this space. So again, we're looking forward to this new program. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ayers. And uh, I'm looking at the clock, I'm realizing I get so excited about our offerings that I just go on and on. We could do a whole other round of questions about the, the, the programs and what they mean. But um, I wanna thank you all, the, the faculty for participating and Justin, I think he had to head off to do dad duty. Um, thank you all again for uh, participating in this and I'm going to move on to the next session, which I believe is also me. Let's see. So Allison, um, with your permission, I will go through this set. Sounds good, okay. So our courses, regardless of program, run in a seven week format. So unlike a traditional 14 or 15 or 16 week semester, there's actually two sessions in each semester and we never stop. We operate in summer too, summer also. So there's two sessions in the spring, there's two sessions in the summer, there's two sessions in the fall. There's six sessions. They're mostly seven weeks in length. Some variability there, but that's basically the model. You can start in any one of those sessions, uh, by the way. Our classes are small. We cap our classes around 20-ish, um, and some will be perhaps much smaller than that, and that gives you even greater access to those faculty and, and those connections. A typical week, um, let me back up in case folks don't know what asynchronous means. So what we're doing right now is synchronous. It's in real time together. Asynchronous is the opposite of that. It's everything is pre-built in such a way that there is deadlines and there is a cadence to the session and the weeks and the modules, but you can do your reading. You can watch your lecture videos um, you can work on discussion posts, answering substantive, practical, scenario-based topics oftentimes in the discussion board, um, work on other written assignments and other work in your own time within the timeframes of, of, the, of the calendar. So a typical week starts on Monday, ends on Sunday. You're being exposed to a, a new topic each week, typically. And with that, you're being given a clear set of expectations in terms of what was this topic designed to teach you? How am I going to teach it to you as the teacher? Then you do the assigned readings. Um, there's usually video lecture, almost always video lectures. They're usually short because we don't see it as the equivalent of a face-to-face -face experience where you would have been in the classroom for three hours on a Thursday night listening to somebody talk. So now you're going to be in your living room on a Thursday night listening to, some, for, to somebody talk for three hours. That's not what it is. It's short, to the point, um, again, practical uh, uh, issues that the faculty are relating to the readings um, that they're giving you. And then the discussion forums. We call our discussion forums academic dialogue because it's not just a place to say, uh, great point, Jane, 
thanks for that. That doesn't earn you credit. Um, adding substantive feedback to your peers, uh, deepening the conversation, critically analyzing the issue, furthering it, right? That is what the discussions are about. So we really challenge um, students in that way. And then of course, there's other written assignments. Uh, professors, we've already said, they are there to grade you, to answer questions, to do office hours, to have meetings, to provide guidance on papers, perhaps on early drafts, that sort of thing, and to become part of your professional network. If you're taking a three credit class with us, which is a typical standard college class, you might expect to spend around 15 or so hours. Um, that's a very broad estimate, depending on your background and experience, but per week, that's what it would be because remember it's a full three credit class, but it's smashed into seven weeks. And if you're taking a one credit class, it would be about a third of that. So maybe five, six hours a week. Um, some students can take four credits at a time and with proper time management, et cetera, um, they can complete their LLM in as little as a year. And we'll get into that detail in, the, in a little bit. Next, I wanna hand it to new Nicole to talk broadly about some of the student resources available and to introduce a couple other people. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well and uh, thanks for joining us. So Albany Law School has uh, a variety of different uh, resources that support our online students. Uh, first and for foremost, we have uh, research support. So we actually have um, Tom Hemstock from the library that is um, transitioning into a research support role that is able to assist our students with writing and research help. And it's awesome because he is really able to explain the ins and outs of the library, what it offers, including Westlaw, uh, LexisNexis, and uh, Bloomberg Law, which are all central to um, research writing. So um, Tom could hop on right now, and he's welcome to share that with you guys. Uh, sure. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, this may sound off topic, but recently I was watching this, this cool science fiction movie. And when our heroes make it to the mad scientist layer, there's like this holographic projection warning them. And as they get further into the layer, they realize, oh my gosh, this person has been dead. It's a message from beyond the grave. And when I, why I say that is sometimes when you're just watching videos, you might be thinking, boy, you know, is there anyone behind that screen there? And it can be kind of maddening. And I think as we're finding out from this message, yes, there are people behind the screen. Uh, so when I get research uh, emails from students throughout the week, uh, it's not just a form letter, me saying, hi, thank you, I've received your uh, email. You can find our eBooks here, link. No, I'm, I'm going in there. We're setting up Zoom meetings one-on-one -on -one with students on how to research. It's like, well, why do you want that ebook? Are there other different ones we could look at? That type of thing. Also, I was going to say we start doing research on day one, uh, but I've realized it's now going to be before day one. Uh, so even before you start your classes, we are developing a soon to be launched legal research orientation uh, to get you prepared. So if, you're, if you have no idea what a Westlaw is or what a LexisNexis is uh, or what a Bloomberg law is, you will know that before uh, the first day of class. Uh, you will be able to put it on your LinkedIn profile. I am now familiar with re legal research in Westlaw. And again, these tutorials are not just uh, pre-recorded. They have a discussion board where I am jumping in and, and getting feedback. And if you're still, you know, if you have any further questions, it's, well, let's set up a Zoom meeting, right? Why, how does this connect to government affairs or how does this connect to compliance, et cetera? So there's always someone behind the screen. Uh, and thank you all for indulging me in my sci-fi story. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate that nice little overview that you have. Um, so another thing that we have at Albany Law School that's not necessarily a student resource, but we do have a pretty awesome community that you are able to use as a student resource. So actually, right now on the call, we do have, uh, let me see, we have Marissa Hochberg on here to talk about being um, a member of the Student Bar Association, which is another Thing that all of our students are eligible to participate in if they would like. Hi all, how are you? My name is Marissa and I am the executive secretary of the Student Bar Association. 
Um, the Student Bar Association oversees clubs and activities on campus and is the principal channel of communication between the student body, the faculty, and the administration. And the organization allocates funding for student organizations and events through uh, student activity fees that everyone is charged with every semester. Um, and it is also a resource for those participating in the master's program as well. It is directed by the legislative legislative body of student representatives, and there is a senator position for master's students. So if anyone is interested in that, I would be happy to answer questions about that. And a lot of clubs are doing Zoom meetings. And if you want to get involved in any clubs or have questions about them, you can ask me. And if you do come to the school, there's so many emails being sent out about all the clubs. So there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. And if anyone has any other questions about it, I would be happy to answer them. And Nicole can give you my information. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. That was a really awesome overview. We appreciate it. So Marissa is just one of the individuals that you would have the pleasure to meet with if you decide to become a student at Albany Law School and participate in our Student Bar Association. Uh, we also have a number of other opportunities to connect with individuals in the online school. Uh, we have a Facebook group called the Online Student Cafe, and that's a place essentially where we will post um, uh, any types of events that are going on either virtually or on campus that you're eligible to participate in. And it's also a place for you to stay up to date with um, registration. We have webinars that we do on a monthly basis that we encourage all of our students to attend if they can, uh, depending on the subject matter, time of day. Etc. Those are all really great opportunities to network. Um, that's one of the, the basis of the program is that you really want to network with the individuals within uh, the online community, as well as our uh, 10,000 plus alumni community. Uh, those are some assets that uh, you'd be able to obtain. And lastly, before I forget, uh, we do have a dedicated career counselor that is able to assist all of our online students with um, all of the little details that would go into finding your career path. So for that, I would introduce uh, Mary Walsh Patrick. I see that she's still on. So she is the head of that program. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mary. Uh, so I'll leave that to you to explain. Great, thanks, Nicole. So, so um, as you heard, um, all of our online students are provided with um, resources such as individualized career coaching, which includes help with resumes, cover letters, and other application materials, and also preparing for interviews. Um, we also help our students to identify opportunities and connect them with our robust Albany Law Network to help them um, increase their chances of obtaining their desired position. All right, thank you so much. So thank you, Nicole. So I want to throw it back to Tom Hemstock just for a brief moment to mention, uh, as Nicole alluded to earlier, a new endeavor we're breaking into in 2022 that Tom is also going to help us with in a, in a bigger way. Take it away, Tom. Cool. Uh, Thank you. In addition to research support, I'm also offering writing support, time management and study skills there. Uh, so balancing a career and family and an academic program is incredibly difficult. I know uh, I was when I was in law school, I was a night student uh, and I know how tricky that can be. Uh, so this is just another resource for you. It's not that, oh, no, you're in trouble. No, it just this is something else to help out uh, experience what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, some just another set of eyes on a paper, for example. So, yep. And uh, I don't have any uh, movie analogies in time for this one, but. <laughs> Same thing, just, just shoot an email. Uh, this isn't a formal thing. I'm not gonna be talking to a professor and say, boy, this, this student's really uh, not doing well. No, this is just informal, confidential um, to, to provide some assistance. We know all of our students um, you know, come from different backgrounds, have different experiences, different education levels. Um, some people have multiple degrees and this stuff comes easy and others, 
don't and it and it doesn't. So just to have that extra support um, around will be very helpful, I think, to to many of our students. Thank you, Tom. And I have no doubt that in short order you will have a movie analogy for this. Well. <laughs> yeah, next open house. So if it's been two, uh, 10 years since or more since you've written a paper, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, and I think we're going to hand it back to Allison. Is that right? Um, or Nicole, I think we can throw it to Nicole first, and then I'll go over the next one. Is that okay? Sure. So program program requirements. This is kind of the nitty gritty. This is pretty important. Um, so with our master's degree, it is a thirty credit program, and we are requiring that all master's students take our um, MSLS five hundred or introduction to law and legal methods for non-lawyers. This is essentially uh, Tom Hemstock's class, and this is where it prepares you to do uh, legal citations and blue book citations, essentially how to write a law school quality uh, research paper. So that's one of our required courses. And then we require that students take 18 credits um, in their chosen discipline. So with that being said, if you are interested in cybersecurity, we require that you take 18 credits in cybersecurity. Um, and then lastly, we, we require that students take a three credit thesis course. This is essentially the capstone course. And we require the thesis for the master's degree as well as the LLM. Um, so the LLM degree is 24 credits. And this is for individuals that hold a JD degree and have graduated from law school. Um, and this is a, um, like I said, 24 credits, and we require that 18 of those credits be in the chosen discipline. And if you're wondering what happens to the other additional credits that are lingering, uh, we allow students to actually um, choose electives. So that's any course outside of their chosen discipline. So if you're a cyber major and you are interested in pursuing um, a couple of financial classes, you're eligible to do that. Um, and they will apply directly to your degree. And lastly, we have a advanced certificate, which is a nine credit program, and we require that individuals complete nine credits within their discipline. Great, and I can take that over, and I know um, I believe, is Joanne still here with us on the call? I am. Hi, Joanne. Um, since we hi. just went over the program requirements, did you just want to say hi to the group? And because um, you're you're a big part of that for them um, and just kind of talk a little bit about the registrars. Sure, I can do that. So welcome, everyone. I'm uh, the assistant dean and registrar at the law school. So we su provide support for every student at the law school, regardless of what program you're in, certificate, LM, JD, masters. Um, we uh, work with, we work very closely with the online graduate school for registration. We are in the process of finalizing degree audits to make the career path look easier to complete visually, um, instead of some of the older, you know, we're, we're, we're basically modernizing our, our world, so, which is great. <laughs> um, you know, all the grades come through uh, the registrar's office. We provide transcripts um, and your diploma at the, when you finish, so that's very exciting. Um, and my office, um, while we're on campus, and we obviously support the students on campus. We support everyone online as well. So, you know, we have many students um, calling, emailing. Uh, we're here to assist you uh, the best to the best of our abilities. So welcome. And the best part, if I can add, is we do of course welcome and allow our online students to walk at commencement if they're in the area or want to get here. And of course, your office is instrumental in that process. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I, you know, and I think that there's a lot of times for the students um, that you'll have conversations with them, Joanne, about um, this track or that track, meeting those requirements, talking about, well, you know, I think I've decided I might want to go into another direction. 
Um, and you're really that go-to person to say, how can this happen? How can it, can it be done? And there's many cases where once you've enrolled, we'll tell students, that's a conversation you'll have to have with the registrar's office. Um, and so certainly um, I'm sure those today who end up enrolling, you will, they will speak with you on many occasions um, or email with you as well. So thank you for, for being here tonight um, and giving you um, that, uh, that overview. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to, I know that we're a little over the 6.30 marker, um, but I would like to speak to the admissions process. So we've heard so much today about um, all of our programs, and, um, and now if you're ready to say, wow, you know, this is the program for me, and that I would like to enroll at Albany Law School, how does that happen? So um, I'm here, um, Stephanie's here, Nicole's here. Um, we are here to help you through this admissions process. Make sure that you reach out and talk to us if you have questions. But what we're gonna help, help you do is guide you to make sure that one, are you applying for the right program? If you already have a JD or an LLB, you would be looking at our LLM program. If you have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or PhD, but if you don't have a JD degree or an LLB, then you're looking into our master's program. Um, the advanced certificate, we have applicants um, who have range. They may have their JD, their LLB, uh, a master's of just a bachelor's, um, so minimum requirement is a bachelor's for the advanced certificate degree. So that's the first thing that we want you to identify. If you need help with that, we will help you with that. Um, then the next thing is to um, identify that program of study. We do have students who come in with one focus. Um, sometimes they come in with that cyber and they end up going to finance um, or human resource or health one. They change while they're with us. Um, so we do have that ability to help you through that, but we would at least really want to identify one discipline when you come in. Tom had mentioned before that you can start at any term. So if, um, if our spring two session is the session that works for you, that's fine. If you're looking for our January, we are actually still accepting applications for our January on term, which starts January 18th, and the application portal is open until December 31st. Um, and so we will give you a coupon code so you can email us when you're ready to apply, uh, regardless of which term, um, as our application process is free. Um, all applications, documents, anything, it all goes through LSAC, which is Law School Admissions Council, and they work with us to process all of our applications. Um, and then we can go to the next slide and I can review the, what makes a completed application? So um, a completed application is first is your e-app. So it's electronic app. And so you're gonna submit your e-app through lsac.org. And part of that is your application. And then you will submit a statement of interest answering the following three course um, questions that we have listed. That will also be in the application instructions. So you don't have to write this down or memorize it today. Um, we will ask you for your resume, um, and once again, we do not have an application fee. The second part of your, um, your, the admissions process is to set, submit a document, document assembly service report, and that is all of your transcripts from all of your colleges, professional technical schools, and law schools you've attended. So clearly, if you're going for the master's program and you don't have a JD, you won't have law school transcripts to submit. Anyone who is applying um, that has international transcripts. You don't have to go to another translation company such as West. You would just send all of your international transcripts directly into LSAC. They are going to evaluate that for us. And then you'd be able to, that documentation would be sent to us. Um, all of your transcripts can be sent electronically to LSAC. Um, there is a drop down, and you can complete it in that manner. And then in addition, we ask for one letter of recommendation. All of these components are going to combine together to complete a complete application. Um, one of the things is that there is a small fee that um, LSAC will charge in regards to document assembly service and to send that report to us. So that is the only fee that you will incur. Um, if you are applying to multiple law schools, the nice thing about using LSAC is that you only have to request your transcripts to one place um, and have it translated one time because they will then be able to get all of your um, documents to any other institution that you apply to. So it is a really great resource and source for us to utilize um, for you as well. Um, standardized test scores are optional and they're not required for admissions. If you have them and you'd like to submit them, you are more than welcome to. So we have a holistic approach um, to all of our files reviewed. Um, we really wanna make sure that our students are prepared, um, that they are looking into the right program, 
um, and that they're ready because we want to see you be successful from day one and see you make it to commencement um, and walk across that stage and graduate. Um, and so basically, once your file is complete, it goes into review. Um, we email all of our decisions and then we will um, also let you know of any, you know, the next steps um, once you've received that acceptance. We do ask for a seat deposit um, is required um, as, you know, our programs are designed to be small and high touch and seats are limited. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, you have those opportunities. Um, the next, we know that tuition, scholarships, and financial aid are um, a major part of any um, academic decision um, to enroll. And so certainly you can have a question, uh, conversation with our director of financial aid at any point in time, even prior to being accepted, prior to applying. Um, Andrea Weather, she's not with us tonight, but um, she is always available. You can send her an email. We can certainly give you that contact information. So our tuition for the 2021-2022 academic year um, is our LLM. Um, it is a thir it's 1310 with, um, with the scholarship. Um, our master's um, per credit um, is $1,040 um, with the scholarship. Um, and our advanced certificate is 800 per credit. So for our LLM and masters, that when you're accepted, you're automatically considered for that scholarship. Um, so all accepted students will receive that, that uh, scholarship. Our advanced certificate students, um, please note that financial aid is not offered for the advanced certificate. However, we do have for the LLM and the masters, we do have financial aid available and we also have cost of living available um, for those programs as well. Um, and you would apply, apply through the FAFSA. Um, and the scholarship that's received with our tuition, um, that is, like I said, that will be automatically part of your acceptance letter um, and part of your award, your financial aid award. Um, and so I, if there's any questions, let us know. I'm um, here in admissions. We're here to help you through that whole process. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Tom for some final thoughts um, regarding our open house and, um, and to close out our evening for, you, for us. Thanks again, Allison and Nicole and the whole team for being here. Some of the faculty who have stuck with us. Uh, we went over by 15 minutes this time. Darn it, I'm trying to be on time for people, but I'll be quick. I just wanted to say uh, that we know that this is a big decision. A lot goes into choosing a program. Um, first, you're committing to go back to school. That takes time, that takes energy, that takes money, that takes effort, right? Then you're, co you're committing to taking the leap into online studies. That can be scary for some people, but yet it gives you the great flexibility, right? Third, you're finding the academic program that best meets your career needs and your interests. And the sky's the limit perhaps there. And fourth is the cost value proposition. What is this ultimately going to get you for what you're putting into it? That's a lot to work through. This can take time. Um, yes, our next application deadline is December 31st for the spring one session. But as we've said, our session, we admit students at all six sessions. So join us in March, join us in May, join us in July, join us in late August. Um, make the decision that's right for you and make it according to the timeline that's right for you, but keep us updated because we're happy to have as many conversations to talk about careers, to put you in touch with one of the faculty who knows the field um, and what the prospects might be for you. We're happy to do whatever we can to help you make the right decision for you. So with that, um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, Happy holidays, happy new year if we don't talk before then. I believe the team will be in touch in the next few days. Um, so you'll have a chance to get to hear from them again. Um, but this concludes the event tonight. If anyone has any specific questions, we're happy to stick around for a few moments or you're, you're uh, welcome to head out. Thanks everybody. So we have a few students on still. No questions? Okay. Well, and feel free to email us at the um, graduate admissions at albanylaw.edu with any questions because we know there's always questions after our events. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us and we can also set up um, a Zoom or a phone call um, at some other point as well. 
um, with us in admissions. Um, so thank you all so much for, for being here. Sabir, thank you for uh, staying uh, awake and uh, joining us, um, you know, and, and making that commitment to be here with us. We really appreciate that. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night, good night. everyone.